Good morning. How's everybody doing today? Cool. Um, I'm stoked to be here. Uh, my name is Kavya, and I'm here today to really wake you up. And the way I'm going to do that is we're going to talk about the innards of the Go scheduler. <laughs> what better way to wake up, right? Um, now, first things first, what is the Go scheduler? The scheduler is, simply put, the behind the scenes orchestrator of your Go programs. So say we have a simple program that looks like this. This is an image processing program, and this will be our example for the rest of the talk. We have the main Go routine. It creates some processing Go routines, and then it waits on a channel. Each processing Go routine creates another Go routine. It does the complicated algorithm, the processing, and then it writes to the file system. Now in this program, and every other program, Go program, the scheduler is what makes it so that the Go routines your program creates are actually run, and that they run concurrently, independently. It pauses and resumes them when they block on a channel or a mutex operation. It's also the thing that coordinates network I.O. and blocking system calls, like that file system call. This is a blocking call in Linux. It also runs runtime tasks like garbage collection. It does it all. And the neatest thing about it, it can do it all for tens and even hundreds of thousands of Go routines. That's cool. But that's not the only reason to care about it. Given it's this, this central piece of how our Go programs are run, its design and its scheduling decisions about what to run when have a huge impact on the performance of our programs. And so, because it's cool and because it's important, today we ask, how does this, the Go scheduler do what it does? And to answer that question, rather than me standing here and talking, telling you about it, um, we're going to try and build it from scratch together. Step zero, we ask the important questions. We try and understand the problem we're trying to solve. Step one, we build it. And finally, we step back and assess it. So let's start with what is perhaps the most important question of any engineering project. Why? Why are we building it? Why does Go need a scheduler? And the answer is because Go uses Go routines. And Go routines are what we call user space threads. Now, they're conceptually similar to threads, technically called kernel threads. Um, but the big difference is that they're managed entirely by the Go runtime. Now, why would Go choose to use these user space threads? And it's because they can be implemented to be uh, more lighter weight and faster. Go routines, for example, have a smaller memory footprint than kernel threads. They're also a lot faster to create and destroy and context switch between. So that's nice. We want these lightweight uh, user space threads. There's only one problem. The operating system only knows how to schedule to put kernel threads on the hardware, on your CPU cores. So how would these Go routines run? And this is where the Go schedule comes in. It puts Go routines on kernel threads, which run on the CPU. Um, cool, so the Go scheduler does all this multiplexing of Go routines onto kernel threads. Um, so our second question is, that's the why, but when does it do all the scheduling? And if you think about it for a second, you'll see we know the answer to this question, right? It's basically, any time our program does something that should or would affect Go routine execution. So Go routine creation, when we want to start running Go routines, Go routine blocking, when the Go routine pauses. Um, the scheduler is also invoked for things like network I.O. and that blocking system call, because it can cause our Go routine to pause. Now the important thing to know about the blocking system call, and we'll come back to this later, is that it causes the underlying kernel thread to also block. So not just the Go routine, but the thread itself will block. OK. So now at this point, we've answered two of our three prerequisite questions, um, why and when. 
The last question left to answer is, what do we want to accomplish? Or if you prefer, what are our get goals? <laughs> OK, so our goals here, um, first things first, these operating system threads, these kernel threads, they're expensive. So we want to use a small number of them. Our second goal comes from the fact that Go is intended for highly performant systems. So we want to be able to support high concurrency. Applications should be able to create lots of Go routines, and our scheduler should be able to keep up. And our third goal has to do with the fact that we live in an age of multi-core everything. We want to leverage hardware parallelism. We want to scale to n cores. Basically, if your machine has n cores, it can run n things in parallel, up to n things in parallel, because it can run up to n threads in parallel. So we want Go programs to be able to run up to n Go routines in parallel. OK. Um, now, bef okay. now, before we move on, a quick picture. Um, so this is the picture we'll be using for the rest of the talk today. Um, this is how the scheduling works, where when the Go routine um, makes a call that switches into the scheduler, under the hood, the runtime switches your program into the scheduler. So it's at those events, the create event and the channel receive. Now, what the scheduler does at this time, um, it might actually continue running the same Go routine on the thread. This is what happens when you create a Go routine. That Go routine can keep running. So in that picture, we see gmain keeps running on the main thread. Um, in the case of a channel receive, however, we want the Go routine to block. So gmain is switched out for G1. Does this make sense so far? Cool. OK. Now that we're done with the why and the when and the what, let's get building. So our question for today is how do we go about multiplexing these Go routines onto kernel threads? And if you stare at that, you'll see we can tease it apart into two simpler questions. Uh, the question of when to create these kernel threads and a question of how to distribute Go routines across threads. Now, first things first, we need a way to track the Go routines that need to be run, right? So our program creates these Go routines. We need somewhere to, to know that these Go routines are ready to be run and they need to be scheduled onto kernel threads. So to do this, we're going to do what the Go scheduler does. We're going to use um, a heap allocated struct called a run queue. This is a first in first out queue, which works pretty much like you'd imagine. So when there's a create event, the new Go routine is added to the tail of the queue. And when it's time to run a Go routine, you run it from the head of the queue. OK. Now, before we start brainstorming ideas and schemes to answer those two questions, um, we need a way to test them out. And to do this, we're going to use our example program. Uh, we don't care about the second part so far. We care about the first part. So gmain is going to create Go routines G1 and G2, and then it's going to block on that channel. We're also going to assume that we're running on a machine with two CPU cores. OK, then. Let's start with the non-ideas first, things we can throw right out of the window to begin with. The first is multiplexing all Go routines onto a single kernel thread. So this is N1 scheduling. Anybody see a problem with this? Well, this doesn't give us any concurrency. If that Go routine performs a blocking call, the thread will block, which means all the other Go routines don't get to run. The other problem is that this doesn't give us parallelism, right? We're restricting ourselves to using a single thread, even though the hardware can support n threads. We got to do better. The, so the, uh, at the other end of the spectrum, the other idea, the other non-idea, rather, that we can throw out the window is to create and destroy a thread per Go routine. Now, why is this bad? Well, we, we just said that kernel threads are expensive to create and destroy. That's what we're trying to minimize. So doing this would destroy the entire, would defeat the entire purpose of using Go routines. So we're going to throw this one out, too. OK, well, 
let's see. We want threads, but we don't want too many thread creations and destructions. So what do we do? Well, here's an idea. We could just reuse threads. The way the scheme works is we'll create a thread when needed. So when there is a go routine to run uh, and all our threads are busy. But then when the thread frees up, say the go routine exits, rather than destroying it, we'll keep it around for reuse. And the way we'll do this is we'll park the thread, which means we'll put it to sleep so it frees up the CPU, and we'll track it so we can find it later when we need to wake it up. Now, for the question of how to distribute go routines across the threads we create, we'll have that run queue, and all threads will get their work from that run queue. Seems like a decent start. Let's try it out. So we have the main Go routine running on the main thread. Now all Go programs start out this way. Now Gmain creates G1. So we put G1 on the run queue. Now we do our checks. There is work to do. Our, all threads are busy, so we're going to start T1. Now T1 comes along, and it pops off G1 from the run queue, and it runs it. So far, so good. Now say G1 exits, rather than destroying T1, we're going to park it and put it on that idle threads list. Now this is where the scheme is different than, the, than one of the schemes we threw away, right? We've been so far. Now G2 is created by Gmain, and this time we're going to do the same thing, add it to the run queue, but there is an idle thread. So we're just going to reuse that thread, and we're going to have T1 run G2 this time. And this is the second difference. We're reusing the thread. So this is pretty good. This is, like they say, a match made in heaven. So at this point, we have a scheme. Uh, there's concurrency, it provides parallelism, and it nicely reduces thread creations. Anybody see any problems with this scheme? Well, for one, we have many threads mutating a single data structure. So we need a lock. And locks are inherently bad for scalability. What they do is they effectively serialize go routine cre uh, scheduling. We can only schedule one go routine at a time. But there's a bigger problem with this scheme, which is what happens if Gmain creates 10,000 long-running go routines in quick succession. We're going to create 10,000 threads. So in this scheme, we can still have an unbounded number of threads accessing the run queue. And an unbounded number of threads accessing a shared data structure with a lock? Hella contention, man. Which means the scheme is hella not scalable out the window. All right, that said, this idea of reusing threads is still a good idea. It amortizes the cost we paid for creating the thread because we're reusing it, so we'll hold on to it. The problem is this unbounded threads accessing the run queue. So hey, why don't we just limit the number of threads that can access the run queue? Now, this scheme is very similar to the scheme we just talked about, except there's one extra check when we create a thread before we do that. We check to see if the number of go routine running threads is already less than, is already equal to or greater than the limit, the limit we set. If it is, we're not going to start a thread. Now, the, the, an important specification is that this limit applies to threads accessing the run queue only, because we're trying to solve the contention problem. Um, so threads running go routines. It does not apply to threads blocked in system calls. OK, now, as before, we're going to keep threads around for reuse, and we're going to use the run queue to give them work. Seems pretty good. Let's try it out. Uh, but before that, we have an important question to answer. What should our limit be? Now, why does this matter? Well, if we set our limit too high, we'll have too much contention, and that's no good. But if we set the limit too low, we won't be using all the CPU cores available to us. We'll be giving up on hardware parallelism, and we don't want to do that either. So what should we set the limit to? Well, hey, 
we could just set it to the number of CPU cores, and that way we get all the parallelism we want. OK, so we have a limit. Our limit is the number of CPU cores we have, which is two. So we're going to limit the number of threads that can be running GoRoutines at any time to two. Now, we've skipped ahead the, to the program um, to the interesting point, which is we have two GoRoutine running threads already. And now Gmain is going to create another GoRoutine. Now we're going to add G2 to the run queue. We're going to do our checks, but this time there's an extra check. And wait a minute, we already have two GoRoutine running threads, so this time we're not going to create another thread. Well, what happens to G2 then, just sitting in the run queue? Well, don't worry. At a future scheduling point, like when G1 blocks on the channel, G2 will be scheduled. Cool. So this seems like a reasonable scheme. We've gotten around our unbounded threads problem without giving up on parallelism. Should we ship it? What happens when the number of cores increases? Say you upgrade your hardware and you suddenly have 124 cores. That's the dream, right? Well, as the number of cores increases, that limit goes up, which means we can have more threads running GoRoutines and more threads accessing the run queue. And before you know it, rah, rah, we're in hella contention land again. Now, just how bad is this contention? How bad does it get as you increase the number of cores? That's a great question. And to answer that question, um, I ran an experiment. I modified the Go scheduler. Uh, I changed it so it behaves in this way. It uses a global run queue with a limited number of threads set to the number of CPU cores. Now, everything else about the runtime is the same. I then ran my scheduler versus the Go scheduler against one of the benchmarks in the Go repo. What this benchmark does is it creates as many CPU cores as you have. It creates those many Go routines in parallel, and it does that repeatedly until there's a total, some threshold number of Go routines created. Now, I ran, I ran this against both schedulers on a four core and a 16 core machine. The results? I'd say they're pretty persuasive. On a four core machine, the modified scheduler takes about four times longer than the Go scheduler. But on a 16 core, it takes 31 times longer. So performance doesn't get worse linearly with the number of cores. It gets worse a lot faster. So nope, we're not shipping this. OK, that said, this idea of setting the number of GoRoutine running threads to the number of CPU cores is still a good idea, right? It means we're maximally leveraging parallelism. We literally cannot do better because we're limited by the hardware. So we'll hold on to it. The problem, the crux in this case, was this shared run queue. So here's an idea. Let's just use distributed run queues. The way this scheme works is on an N core machine, we're going to have N run queues. And we're going to use one run queue per thread. So a thread claims a run queue to run GoRoutines, which means it inserts and removes GoRoutines from that run queue only um, for the time it's associated with it. Now, as before, we're going to reuse threads. OK, let's try it out before we make any claims. OK, so notice in this case we have two run queues because we're running on a two core. We have run queue A and run queue B. T main is currently associated with run queue A. Now T main creates a go routine, go routine one. It's added to its run queue. As before, we do our checks. And we can have two go routine running threads, and we have only one. So we're going to start a thread. We're going to start T1. Now, T1 is going to claim the other run queue, run queue B, and wait a minute. Its run queue is empty. There is work in the system, but it's in the other run queue. What do we do? Well, if we want something 
that somebody else has, we could just steal it. Don't quote me on that. So the idea here, and this is a legitimate idea um, in the literature, it's called work stealing. Um, and the idea is, if the local run queue is empty, the thread is going to pick another run queue at random and steal half its workload. Now, the nice thing about work stealing is it organically balances work across threads, right? Because the free threads will steal work from the overloaded threads. OK, sounds good. Let's apply work stealing to solve our problem. OK, so we're in this situation where T1 has an empty local run queue. So it's just going to steal G1. And then it can run it. Great. Everything is good again. So let's move on. Now, this scheme's looking really promising so far. It scales nicely with the number of CPU cores because we have effectively per core run queues. Um, and threads don't contend because these run queues are independent. The work across threads is balanced, too, because of work stealing. For once, we can continue and finally get to run G1. Now, this is the part of the program we care about. G1 is going to create G3, and then it's going to do that blocking system call. OK, so T1 runs G1, which creates G3, which gets put into its run queue. Now, we're not going to start a thread this time, because we already have two GoRoutine running threads on our two core. Now, G1 does that blocking system call. Do you see where this is going? Yeah. Well, when G1 does that syscall, G1 is going to block, but T1 is also going to block. Problem number two. We have a local run queue with work, but its thread is blocked. Well, what do we do now? Well, all we need, really, is a mechanism to transfer the blocked thread's run queue to another thread. This mechanism can simply be a background thread, a monitor, that takes the run queue and gives it away. Now, why do we need a background thread? Why can't the thread itself, before entering the system call, just give its run queue away? That would be simpler. And the reason is because we don't know ahead of time for how long a system call is going to block, right? And we don't want the thread to give away its run queue um, and finish up the system call really quickly and then be out of a run queue, be out of work. And so we use this background thread. Um, now, how do we, who do we give away the run queue to? Well, if we have parked threads, we can wake them up and give them the run queue. And if we don't have parked threads, we can start a thread. Now, wait a minute. What about our limit to the number of GoRoutine running threads? Well, remember, that's exactly what it is. It is a limit on the number of GoRoutine running threads. The original thread is now blocked in a system call, so it's effectively freed up a slot for another GoRoutine running thread. So that's what we're going to do. In this case, um, this mechanism is called handoff. And it's nice because it prevents GoRoutine starvation, right? It means G3 will get to run. All right, so now let's go and rescue G3. OK, so here we are. T1 is blocked, and G3 is sitting in the run queue. We're going to hand it off. So that background thread does its check. It finds the run queue with work. It sees the thread is blocked and blocked for a little bit of time. So it starts a thread. It starts T2. And then the monitor is going to hand the run queue to T2, and then T2 can run G3. Great. This is exciting. We have finally reached the end of our program. Um, and even better, we have a scheme that seems to work. It scales nicely. We've solved GoRoutine starvation. We've solved unbalanced workloads. Is this it? Have we arrived? And yes, we have. This is the Go Scheduler. The, the Go Scheduler uses 
these ideas, the goodness of these ideas, um, to do its thing. It reuses threads. It limits the number of Guruteen running threads to the number of CPU cores. Go max prox anybody. And it uses distributed run queues with stealing and handoff. Now, we would be done at this point, except there's one last problem, a curveball, if you will. Now, everything we've talked about so far, all the scheduling, works as long as the program makes those calls to call into the scheduler, right? It happens under the hood, but the program does that go routine creation, does that channel blocking. It's cooperative. What happens if we have a guruteen that does not cooperate, that does not make any of those calls? Like, say, complicated algorithm is a CPU-bound computation that runs for a long, long time and never yields the CPU. Well, if we never call into the scheduler, nothing else is going to get scheduled. So such a CPU hog can starve the run queue. Now, this is no bueno. Uh, what we need is a mechanism to preempt these go routines. So if they're running for too long, we need a mechanism um, to force them to yield to the scheduler. So the go scheduler implements preemption. This is a form of preemption called cooperative preemption. The details don't matter right now. And the way it does this is there is a background monitor thread um, called a sysmon, which stands for system monitor, but it's cuter as a monster, so that's what we're going with. Um, and the sysmon basically detects long-running guruteens so, that have been running for 10 milliseconds, um, and it unschedules them when possible. Now, where would it put these preempted guruteens? We don't want to put them back on the run queue. It would be unfair to the other guruteens that it effectively starved. So where do we put them? The Go scheduler puts them on a global run queue. That's right. The Go scheduler has a global run queue in addition to those distributed per core run queues. It uses this as a lower priority queue of sorts. So threads check it less frequently than their local run queues, so contention is not a problem in this case. The global run queue is used for goroutines in certain other cases as well, but the details don't matter today. OK, no more surprises, I promise. With that, we now have a full understanding of the main ideas, both big and sneaky, behind the Go scheduler. I would love to talk neat implementation detail, but in the interest of time, we won't today. But rest assured, you have all the tools you need to dive into the source yourself. It's very accessible, so go do it. Um, now we will take a step back and assess the scheduler, right? Ask the difficult questions. So first question, how did we do? We started out with a list of goals. How did we do with our goals? What do you think? A plus. We use a small number of kernel threads. Uh, we can support high concurrency, and we can leverage parallelism. We scale to n cores. And this falls out of those three, falls out of those three ideas that we discussed. Let's move on to the harder questions. What are um, the limitations of the scheduler? Well, for one, there is no notion of go routine priority. It uses a first in, first out run queue um, versus, say, the Linux scheduler, which uses a priority queue. Now, the cost benefit trade off of doing this might not actually make sense for Go programs. The second limitation is there's no strong preemption. Um, so, there are no strong um, fairness and latency guarantees. It's entirely possible for a go routine in certain cases to bring the entire system to slow down and halt. Well, the good news is the Go team is working on strong preemption this quarter. There's a fascinating proposal online that you can go read, uh, though it might have changed. Um, and finally, the third limitation that I want to touch upon today is the scheduler is not aware of the actual system of actual hardware topology. So there's no real 
guaranteed um, locality between the data and the goroutine computation. Now, again, for this, there's a dated proposal for a new malware scheduler, but this would be a considerable reworking of the scheduler. OK, and with that, we have come to the end of our scheduler saga. Um, I hope you walk away with an appreciation of the awesomeness that is the Go scheduler, um, and I hope you learned a thing. Thank you.